If you will, go ahead and take your Bibles and turn to 2 John, and we're going to be spending our time there this afternoon as we get started. We will spend some time over in 3 John, but we'll do that uh, just a little bit later on uh, in our study this afternoon. Uh, words seem so inadequate to try to describe how thankful I am for this school, for the men who teach uh, here at this school. But I was talking to someone just a little bit earlier today, and it seems uh, difficult to fathom that I was just walking these halls as a student 20 years ago. And uh, sometimes it seems like it was just yesterday, and other times it seems like it was a lifetime ago. But when I think about those years that we spent here at this school, I was able to receive a top-notch education. I was able just to cross the breezeway in the auditorium to meet the woman who would become my future wife and the mother to our children. I was able to meet a guy who would become my best friend, who was more like a brother to me during those two years that we were here. And then also was able to build a number of relationships that have stood the test of time, been able to catch up with a number of those guys over the last uh, couple of days and being here for the lectureship. And when I think back to what were some of the common things that brought us together, number one, it was our love for Jesus, but number two, it was our love that we have for the truth. And that's the subject, that's the theme that we're talking about this week is the timeless truth. And for the next few moments this afternoon, we're going to be looking at the timeless truth that is found in the epistles of 2nd and 3rd John. Some have described these two epistles as the twin sisters of the scriptures. And the reason for that, number one, is because of their brevity. These are the two shortest epistles in the New Testament. And when you look at these two epistles, you will find uh, basically there's going to be 464 words total, and there's going to be 27 total verses between the two. So number one, you've got the brevity, but a second reason why they're called the twin sisters is because they will impart some very rich material, material that is very worthy of our consideration even today. When we look at 2 John and verse number one, we read there that this particular letter was written to the elect lady and her children. When you get over to 3 John in verse number 1, this particular text here was going to be written to the well-beloved Gaius. The second letter is going to be written to an, un or, uh, excuse me, an unspecified woman and her children, but the second one was written to a specific individual, but they have one common thing behind both of these particular books. And that is, there is the common foundation of the truth. And so for the next few moments this afternoon, there are five things that we're going to notice about the truth. I had prepared for almost 45 minutes with that time slot today. Dan told me a few moments ago that it was only 37 minutes, so we're going to move uh, very quickly through some of our material. We won't cover everything that is in the book uh, this afternoon, but five things that we want to consider for the next few moments. Number one, we're going to notice the principle of truth. If you look there at 2 John, I want you to notice the first four verses, and let's take note of how many times the word truth is going to be mentioned in these opening words. He says, The elder unto the elect lady and her children, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also all they that have known the truth, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. Grace be with you, mercy and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Now notice verse number four, I rejoice greatly that I found of thy children walking in truth as we have received commandment from the Father. In the first four verses, he's going to reference that word truth five times. This will be one of John's most favorite words that he's going to use in all of his writings. When you look at the New Testament, 99 times you will see that word truth. 
John will make reference to it 45 of those 99 times, just a little under half. And when we think about John referring to the truth, especially here in the second epistle of John, three things that I want us to consider about the principle of truth. And the first one is this, truth can be known. When you look there at the end of verse number one, he says, whom I love in the truth, and not only I, but also they that have known the truth. You know, there are a number of misconceptions that people have about truth today. And one of those misconceptions is, is that people cannot really know the truth. You ever try to talk with somebody and, and you try to talk with them about the truth? Well, we just really can't know it. I want to invite your attention back to the gospel account for just a moment, John's gospel account. And let's take note of just a few things that are mentioned there. When you look at John 8 and verse number 32, Jesus said, and ye shall know the truth and the truth shall make you free. If you go back just a few verses to verse number 24, Jesus told the, those religious people there, those Jews, that if you don't believe that I am He, you're going to die in your sins. In John 17 and verse number 17, Jesus is there. He's praying that prayer about unity. You remember what He prays? He says, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is true. How could they be sanctified? How could they be set apart from sin? How could they be set apart for a special purpose if they didn't know what the truth was? But then you look at John 14 and verse number 6, Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man comes to the Father but by me. You see, our Lord was the embodiment of truth. And John himself learned the truth from Jesus while Jesus was here during his earthly ministry. And so when we think about the principle of truth, number one, we can know the truth. Number two, the truth dwells in us. Now, I want you to look at verse number two, and John's going to highlight this very fact. He says, For the truth's sake which dwelleth in us. Now why did John and these other Christians... But why did they love this elect lady and her children so much? Because the truth took root in their life. And the truth needs to take root in your life and it needs to take root in my life as well. Some of the newer translations will use the word abide there for the word dwell. And when you see that word dwell or you see that word abide, the word picture behind it is this. It's the idea of bringing someone into your home as a welcomed guest. When we think about the truth, the truth should be a welcome guest in the heart of every single Christian. But did you know even before John wrote about having the truth abide in us, that the psalmist talked about the truth and, and having the truth abide in us. When you look at Psalm 119 and verse number 11, he said, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. One translation will translate it as the word stored up for the word hid. Thy word I have stored up. Another one uses the, the phrase to treasure up. Do you treasure the truth? Are you hiding the truth? Is it a welcome guest? Are you storing it up? But when we think about the truth dwelling in us, it's not just a one-time occurrence. It's going to be something that's going to be on a continual basis that dwells in us. Number three, when we think about the principle of truth, it's going to be with us forever. Look at the end of verse number two. He says, for the truth's sake which dwelleth in us and shall be with us forever. There were a number of false doctrines that were prevalent during the first century. And one of those false doctrines that John would be combating were the things that the Gnostics were going around and teaching that they believed that there was some type of new special revelation. 
And John was letting his listeners know that the truth, that it's with us forever. I like what Gareth Reese, commentator, had to say on this particular passage. He says, truth is not going to change. What the apostles taught was truth, and no Gnostic could ever change it or add to it. You see, the truth that the apostles taught at the earlier part of the first century was the same truth that was being taught at the end of the first century, and it's the same truth that is supposed to be taught today in the 21st century. When we look over at 1 Peter chapter 1, I want you to notice something that, that Peter writes here in verse number 23. He says, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God. Now notice what he says about the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Verse number 23 talks about the permanent side, but then he's going to make a contrast. He says, for all flesh is as grass. He's talking about our earthly bodies. All flesh is as grass. Now notice what he says next. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass. The grass withereth and the flower thereof falleth away. If you look outside right now, depending on what kind of grass that you've got, if you were to come down to my house in, in Hernando, that grass is still brown right now. We've got Bermuda grass, and that grass really isn't going to start growing until it gets a little bit warmer. And when it gets over 90 degrees, that grass loves the heat, and it's going to be that beautiful green color. Now, if you were to go across town in Hernando, where our kids play uh, soccer at, at the Hernando Soccer Complex, that grass is this beautiful green color right now. And the reason for that is because they've got ryegrass all over. That grass loves this cooler weather. But you know what? In just a short period of time, that ryegrass is going to go dormant. It's going to wither. That Bermuda grass is going to grow. Those flowers, they're starting to bloom just a little bit right now. The, the closer that we get to, the, the, um, uh, to April and the end of April, those flowers, they're really going to start blooming. And if you're like me, allergies are going to get out of control. My nasal passages do not like this time of year. But after a period of time, once those flowers begin to bloom, what's going to happen? Those petals are going to start to fall. And so he's going from permanent, the Word of God, it lives and abides forever, to something that is temporary. But then when you look at verse number 25, he's going to go right back to the permanent, but the Word of the Lord endureth forever. And so number one, we've got the principle of truth. And there are three things that we learn about the principle of truth. Number two, we see the proximity of truth. I want you to look at verse number three. And as we think about the proximity of truth, we're talking about something that is closely related. And let's see if we can take note of three things in particular that are closely related to truth here in this verse. He says, Grace be with you, mercy and peace, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father in truth and love. Did you see three words there? Grace, mercy, peace. It is through the truth that we learn about the grace of God which is able to save our souls, Ephesians 2, verses 8 and 9. It's through the truth that we're able to learn about God's mercy and how we do not get what we deserve. It's through that truth that we learn about His mercy and that lively hope, according to 1 Peter chapter 1, verse number 3. It's also through that truth that we learn about the peace that passes all understanding, Philippians chapter 4 and verse number 7. I'm reminded of what James wrote in James 1 and verse number 17, where he says, "...every good gift and every perfect gift cometh down from above." From the Father of lights, in whom is no variableness, neither is there shadow of turning. But when you think about that word father there, that word father there, one of the, the background definitions for that is the idea of a source. What's the source of all of these good blessings? Well, what's the source of grace, mercy, and peace? Well, John tells us that the source of grace, mercy, and peace is the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. 
If you look at it from a contextual standpoint there in James chapter 1, you go back to verses 13 through 16. He says, let no man say when I am tempted that I am tempted of God. And then he's going to go into the subject of temptation and where temptation leads, if you give into it, it's going to lead to sin. That's representing the bad, but then when you get to verse number 17, he says, I want to contrast and I want to give you the good. And every good thing that we have, it comes from the Father above. And that's where John traces back these three very important things. And so we see there the proximity of truth. But then number three, we see the practice of truth. I want you to think about the word walk. For just a moment. That's a very important word in our New Testament. You have heard the popular old saying, if you're going to talk the talk, you better be able to walk the walk. Now why has that become a popular saying? Because you and I both know that there are a number of people who are a lot of hot air, aren't they? There are a number of people who are able to talk the talk, but yet they can't back it up with their actions. They can't back it up with their life. And it's even more unfortunate from a spiritual standpoint that there are a number of people who will claim to be children of God, but yet their lives teach something that is far, far different than what Christianity is all about. When we think about that word walk, did you know that that word there, that the Apostle Paul will use that word 30 times in the New Testament? And as Paul uses that particular word, it's a word that characterizes the way that one conducts themselves. It characterizes and, and regulates our behavior and the way that one lives their lives. When we think about the Apostle Paul using this particular word, you may remember that when you look at 2 Corinthians 5 and verse number 7, he says we walk by faith and not by sight. That is, we're going to allow the Word of God to direct our life. Number two, you look at Romans 6 and verse number 4, we're raised to walk how? In newness of life. He's talking about individuals who have been obedient to the gospel. They've just come out of, up out of that watery grave. You now have a new director, and since you have a new director in your life, there's to be a new direction that characterizes that life. When you look at 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse number 13, he tells us that we're to walk worthy of God. But then when you move over into the book of Ephesians, he's going to go back and forth. And he's, going to be, and he's going to mention some things that, that we shouldn't do with our walk. When you look at Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he says, I don't want you to walk after the course of this world. When you look at Ephesians chapter 4, he, he, he writes to them there and he says, I don't want you to walk as other Gentiles walk. I realize you came out of a Gentile background, but lawlessness is no longer going to characterize who God's people are. Then you get to chapter 5, and I oftentimes like to call it the walking chapter of the Bible. Because there, Paul is going to emphasize some important things pertaining to our walk and how we're supposed to live. He says, I want you to walk in love, verse number 2. I want you to walk in light, verse number 8. I want you to walk circumspectly. Now what's he talking about when he says to walk circumspectly? I want you to walk carefully. Because the devil's got a minefield out there. And if you've ever watched a movie, you ever watched a TV show where there's a, a minefield, you, you see people that, that they'll walk very, very carefully. That they'll place their feet strategically one after another each step that they take. Spiritually speaking, we need to be careful of the steps that we take. And we need to make sure that our walk is the walk according to truth. Now, everything that Paul wrote about the subject of walking, John is going to be just as consistent with it as he pens the epistles of 2nd and 3rd John. I want you to look at 2nd John in verse number 4. He says, I rejoice greatly that I have found of thy children walking in truth as we have received a commandment from the Father. It brought great joy to the apostles. To see the elect lady and her children walking in truth. 
When you look over at the book of 3 John and you look at verse number 3, he says, For I rejoice greatly when the brethren came and testified of the truth that is in thee, that's in Gaius, even as thou walkest in the truth. How does a parent respond the very first time that they see one of their children walk? How do you respond to that? Happy. Sir, you're happy, all right? I remember the, the, the first time that we saw our daughter take her, foot, her first steps. I remember the, the first time that we saw our, our two boys take their first steps. But Blair and I, we looked at each other. We were clapping. We were saying things like, well, way to go, keep, keep going, take another step. We were happy. We were rejoicing. But you know, there should be no greater joy than to see our children walking in truth. To see them following after the pathways of truth. When you go to worship this coming Sunday, I want you to try something. When you go in and you sit down, I want you to look around the room for just a moment. When you look around the room, I see some teenagers that are walking in truth. I see some college students that are walking in truth. I see some who are single that are walking in truth. I see these individuals that are about to get married and they're walking in truth. I see these young couples who have just gotten married. They're walking in truth. Young couples who have little children and now they're walking in truth. You get these seasoned parents who have these teenagers. They're walking in truth. You get to those who are empty nesters. Those individuals there, they're walking in truth. And you just keep going around the room. You get to those who are young at heart. They're walking in truth. And then the ones who have maybe lost their mates your widows and your widowers, they're walking in truth. That should bring great joy to us when we sit and we look around the auditorium with those with whom we worship. To see people who are walking and living the truth. When we think about the practice of truth, two things we want to take note of. Number one, it's going to be seen in the way that we live. You see, when you think about the elect lady and her children... When you think about Gaius, reminds me of what the psalmist wrote in Psalm 119 and verse number 30 and also verse number 176. The psalmist says, I've chosen the way of truth. Nobody forced her and her children to follow the way of truth. Nobody forced Gaius to follow the way of truth. No, nobody has forced you or me to follow the way of truth. That, that's a choice that we have made, but the truth, here's the bottom line, it must be personal in our life because it's going to be the truth that we're going to be judged by one day. John chapter 12 in verse number 48. Well, let's look at 2 John in verse number 6 for just a moment because John is going to continue on. He says, and this is love that we walk after his commandments. This is the commandment that as you have heard from the beginning, you walk in it. When we think about our life, our life is going to be governed by something. It's going to be governed by the world, a creed of men, self, or it's going to be governed by the Word of God, by His truth. When we think about Christianity, we need to remember Christianity is more than just a Sunday stroll with Jesus. It's more than something we do just two days out of the week. Christianity is who we are. It's a daily commitment to our Lord. And it's going to be seen in the way that we live. The elect lady and her children, they didn't go around with a sign on their forehead that said, I'm a Christian. Others could see it in the way that they live. When we think about the principle of truth, the second thing to keep in mind, it's going to be seen in the way that we treat others. And that's highlighted, highlighted in the, the, the epistle of 3 John. Let's go over there for just a few moments. 
And there are three individuals that serve as prime examples of how we treat others, or at least how we're supposed to and how we're not supposed to treat others. The first one there is the one to whom the letter was written, verse number one, to the well-beloved Gaius. But how did Gaius treat others? I want you to drop down to verse number six. He says, which have borne witness of thy charity. They've been witnesses of your love before the church. Whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well. Because that for his name's sake they went forth taking nothing of the Gentiles. There are some that may be in this room this afternoon that have traveled in for the lectureship. And when you received your invitation, your flyer in the mail about the lectureship, or maybe you looked online, you saw an advertisement for some of the hotels in the area. And maybe a discount that is associated with a particular hotel because you're here for the lectureship. Generally speaking, when we travel out of town, that's generally where we stay, isn't it? That's, our, that, that's generally the, the, the way that our custom is today. But in the first century, when we think about people traveling from one place to another, hotels were not people's top choice. And the reason for that, these weren't the most sanitary places. Not only were they not clean, that there was a lot of immorality that would take place at hotels. And so where would you go? You'd stop at somebody else's home. When brethren were traveling through, Gaius always had his door open for them. There was always an open invitation there. You know, when I think about him, I think about a man who was a great servant. I think about a man who had the mindset of our Lord. When you look at Philippians chapter 2 and verse number 5, Jesus said, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The, the Apostle Paul there, he's going to continue to write and he, and he takes our attention to Jesus and immediately my mind goes back to John chapter 13. And I think about how Jesus became a servant. We know in Matthew 20 and verse number 28 that, that our Lord did not come to be served but to serve. But when you look at John chapter 13, it would be there on that occasion that he would take the towel and he would perform the job of a servant. But if you look at the beginning of that text and at the end of that text... What's the subject that he talks about? Subject of love. Those serve as the bookends of that text. When you look here at, at uh, 2 John verse number 6, or 3 John verse number 6, they bore witness of what? They bore witness of his love that he had to others and how he served them. Gaius was his name, but hospitality was his game. And he's forever remembered as a man who was hospitable to others. When we think about the subject of hospitality, hospitality is something that, that Christians are to be known for as well. When you look at Romans chapter 12 and verse number 13, he tells us we're to be people who are given to hospitality. When you look over at the book of Titus, one of the qualifications for an individual to serve as an elder, these are individuals who are supposed to be hospitable. And so we're to follow in his footsteps. But then there's a second man that we're introduced here to in the book of 3 John. And that is the man known as Diotrephes. I want you to look at 3 John verse number 9. He said, I wrote unto the church, but Diotrephes, who loveth to have the preeminence among them, receiveth us not. We go from a man who loved the truth and loved others to a man who loved self. A man who got in the way of the truth. When we think about this particular name, Diotrephes, we really don't hear too many parents naming their children Diotrephes today, do we? And a lot of times it's because of the negative connotations that go with it. And when we think about that today in the 21st century, there are some individuals who have a diatrophies complex to them. And unfortunately, a lot of times it's in the eldership position. You see, Diotrephes, he felt like he was the top dog in the kennel, that everything had to run through him, that it was he, he was the one who had to have the final say-so. 
Do you know that, that there's a congregation that I know of that for a number of years this congregation had a man serving in the eldership that many of the members referred to that particular way? Congregation thrived at about, when they were thriving, were about 300. And over time, after this man had served for, I think, about 20 years, that church dropped down to about 125 people. Do you know when that man stepped down, that in less than five years, that church went back to 250? All because that man got out of the way. They felt as if it was a breath of fresh air for the congregation. They didn't have somebody controlling every single thing that was going on. I remember, I guess it was about 18 or 19 years ago now, that I was interviewing at a congregation to be their youth minister. The congregation had about 500 people. I remember sitting with this eldership, and there were 10 elders we had three different meetings with them before we had a scheduled tryout. And I remember a laundry list of questions that, that they had asked that we turn in and submit to them ahead of time. And then we had hour-long meetings each time that we would meet with them in person. They would ask questions, and then I would ask questions back to them. And I started to notice over and over and over again that when I would ask a question, they would all turn their attention to one particular brother in that room. The final day that we had a meeting with those elders, I met with the pulpit minister about 30 minutes ahead of time. And we were sitting down discussing some things, and I told him, I said, I noticed that you've been here for about 10 years. I said, I'm looking to put some roots down and to be at a place for several years. And I said, do you plan on continuing to stay a little bit longer? And he told me, he said, my son's going to be a senior in high school next year. And he said, after that, he said, that's going to be it. And he said, I'm going to plan to move on somewhere else. That was red flag number one. Number two, I asked him, I said, I said um, is there a diatrophies in the eldership? And he looked at me and he said, why do you ask? And I mentioned just a couple of things that I had seen. And he smiled. He wouldn't say anything. He just smiled. And that was enough for me. I didn't want to be a part of something like that. And you could tell it was stifling some of the things with the church. Now, how did Diotrephes, how did he demonstrate preeminence? When you look at the end of verse number 9, he received us not. He resisted the apostles. Verse number 10, wherefore, if I come, I will remember his deeds, which he doeth, prating against us with malicious words and not content therewith. Neither doth he himself receive the brethren and forbiddeth them that would and casteth them out of the church. He was critical of them. He isolated himself from others. He was very controlling. Now, how are we supposed to respond? How was the elect lady and her children supposed to respond being placed in that, or Gaius rather, being placed in that particular situation? Look at verse number 11. He says, Beloved, follow not that which is evil, but that which is good. He that doeth good is of God, but he that doeth evil hath not seen God. The, the final man that we read about here is a man by the name of Demetrius in verse number 12. He hath a good report of all men and of the truth itself. Yea, and we also bear record, and you know that our record is true. Demetrius was a man worthy of imitation, but why? because all the brethren vouched for him. Number two, he also had the stamp of approval from an apostle. But let's think about ourselves for just a moment. Who do we find ourselves like? Do we see more of Gaius? Do we see more of Demetrius? Or do we see a Diotrephes? We're the only ones that can truly answer that question. Who do we see and which one should we be like? Here's point number four to consider, and that is the prohibiting of truth. It is unfortunate that not everything is taught is going to be the truth. That's true today in the 21st century, and it was just as true in the first century. We know that the Apostle Paul warned about false teachers in his writings. We know that from Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 4, one of the warnings that he gave was to be not tossed to and fro 
by every wind of doctrine. He wanted those brethren to be careful. He met with those elders at Ephesus in the city of Miletus. And he made sure that they were aware that grievous wolves would enter in, not sparing the flock. But did you know that John's writing, it's not going to be any different than that of the Apostle Paul's. It's going to be just as consistent. When you look at 2 John in verse number 7, he describes those who were false teachers as deceivers, one who causes others to go astray. When you go back to 1 John, he describes false teachers as false prophets. And one way that you could tell if an individual was a false teacher in the first century, just ask them where they stood on Jesus. Do you believe that Jesus came in the flesh? John, right out of the gate in 1 John 1 and verse number 1, he says, we've heard him, we've seen him, we've looked upon him, we've touched him. He wanted his readers to know exactly where he stood and where they were supposed to stand. If one denied Jesus, he was referred to as an antichrist. Now, how are we to respond today to false teachers? What's our response supposed to be? Number one, we're not supposed to be ugly to them. We can still speak the truth in love, Ephesians 4, verse number 15. But number two, I want you to notice here what, what John writes. If you look at verse number 10 of 2 John, he says, If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine... Receive him not into your house, neither bid him Godspeed. For he that biddeth him Godspeed is a partaker of his evil deeds. When we think about false doctrine, false doctrine has always been a serious problem with God. And he wanted to make sure the elect lady and her children knew exactly what to do with false teachers. Don't accept that. Don't wish them farewell. Don't wish them good luck. Do not receive them into your home. You can still be kind to them, but you're not going to be a participator in the things with which they are doing. And you know, we still have that responsibility today to make sure that we're not promoting false doctrine, to make sure that we're standing up against it. If you want to know just how serious God is about false doctrine, go look at the book of Galatians sometime. Because when you think about Paul's writings, most often when he would start a book, he would write about some of the good things about the congregation. He would commend those brethren. And then he would start challenging them with some things that they need to, to correct. You look at the book of Galatians right out of the gate. He's going to deal with the problems. You've been deceived. Because you've been deceived, we've got some things we've got to deal with and we've got to deal with it very quickly. That's why elders have been given the responsibility of rebuking the gainsayers to do it in such a way that still brings glory and honor to God. Very quickly in our final point, and that is the prize of truth. If we stay with the truth, we're going to be rewarded one day. I want you to look at 2 John verses 8 and 9. He says, look to yourselves. Paul would say, examine yourselves, 2 Corinthians 13, 5. He says that we lose not those things which we have wrought, those things that we work for, but that we receive a full reward. Whosoever transgresseth, the American standard says, going onward there for the word transgresseth. Another translation will use it, will translate it as running ahead. Whosoever runs ahead or goes onward and abides not in the doctrine of Christ, hath not God. He that abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. So we don't abide with him, don't abide with the truth, we don't have God. If we do abide, and we continue to abide, you notice the ETH on the end of the word? It's going to be a continual action. You know what's going to happen? We're going to receive a full reward one day. If you look at Revelation 22, verses 18 and 19, John is the writer there, and he's got one final warning, and that is you don't add to the truth, and you don't take away from it. When we think about the truth from 2nd and 3rd John, we're looking at what has often been called the twin epistles. Number one, because of their brevity, but number two, because of the rich content that is imparted such a short span and the focus that's upon truth and this afternoon we've talked about the principle the proximity the practice the prohibiting and the prize of truth 
it is my prayer that every single person that is in this room and those who may be listening to this lecture online and listening into it in the future, that you hear the words of our Lord, well done, thou good and faithful servant, Matthew 25, 21. But the only way we're going to hear those words, we've got to be individuals who practice the truth. And we've got to live it out in our life every single day. Thank you so much.